All right, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this church that we have. We thank you for the mothers that you have given us and how you use mothers to build your kingdom. Uh, I pray that you would help us to honor our mothers, to cherish them, to give everything we, to give the best of us to them. And I pray that you'd lift them up this day. Amen. All right, we are on to session four and our study in Vantillian Apologetics. So if you weren't here last time, we went through Dr. Stokes' book, A Shot of Faith to the Head, and looked at some of those things and really used it as, I mean, one, a critique, I guess, but also to, to more of an application for what you had learned previous to that and how we can discern how we should be doing apologetics. So we stated and critiqued properly basic beliefs. We showed uh, that Stokes' apologetic is inherently evidential. I don't think he would even disagree with that. I think he's aware of that. <clears throat> uh, we critiqued his claim about the sensus divinitatis. So yes, there is a, there is a sense um, in us that where belief in God naturally comes out of being made in his image, but that belief is always suppressed by man. Right? So what we end up with, what we are willing to affirm as unbelievers is not the truth. It's always an idol. We always corrupt it. We take what is true, the true God, and we corrupt it. We make it into some, some image that's false. And it could be a generic God, right, that doesn't keep us accountable, that we, that, we, that we hold on to. He gives us comfort when we want to pray, something like that. Uh, we, and then we critiqued his claim about the possibility of God not being the creator. This is very common with philosophers, especially Christian philosophers, where they will try to say that atheism hasn't done its job because if they did this, bare theism or some kind of generic theism would still hold true. Of course, that would be catastrophic for Christianity since if God's not the creator, then he doesn't exist we do, and we have no faith. And we also critiqued his solution about the sovereignty of God in relation to creating free creatures. What limits, is, is it God's sovereignty limit our freedom? Does it give us freedom? Or does man's freedom limit God's sovereignty? We talked about that. Uh, this week, we're going to talk about John Frame. So John Frame is a pretty famous theologian in America. He's done ministry for decades and highly valuable to the church and has done wonderful work. His book on apologetics used to be called Apologetics to the Glory of God. Recently, it was retitled Apologetics, a Justification of Christian Belief. I call it Framian apologetics because it is unique in that uh, he explicitly holds certain principles that Van Til held to and taught, but he wants to take, he, th he doesn't think traditional arguments, evidential arguments, are, are very much different. He thinks they can, they can come together in harmony, and so he, he tries to take probability and these, these principles of Van Til and put them together, uh, which is unique, I think, in, as far as I've read, uh, but it's not Van Tilian. I do, it is, I think, basically evidentialism, but it's Frame's twist on it, so I call it Framian apologetics. So that's what we're going to talk about today some more application of what we, what we have learned. In the beginning of this book, the editor, Joseph Torres, writes, AGG, that's just the old title for this book, has served as an introduction to Christian apologetics from a presuppositional or Vantillian perspective for 20 years. This re-release of AGG is long overdue. I suggest three reasons why. AGG's biblical perspective on the discipline of apologetics the constant need to clarify what Vantillian or presuppositional apologetics really is and is not, and a new generation of readers. So this has been the book for when Bonson died, this has been probably the most popular book to clarify Vantillian apologetics. And we're gonna see if it, if it makes good on that, that claim. Uh, but to do that, before we do that, we're gonna go through a little bit, give you a little taste of Van Til and Bonson. How did they view this work? How did they view Van Til's apologetic? And then we're gonna contrast that with what Frame is doing and see if they can go together. So sit back and enjoy Van Til. But the best and only possible proof for the existence of such a God is that his existence is required for the uniformity of nature and for the coherence of all things in the world. So just think about the only proof for God's existence he would say, which is the one he's, he's using, is that God's existence is required for us to know anything. 
It is but to say that Christianity alone is rational. It is but to say that if one leaves the foundation of the presupposition of the truth of the Christian religion, one falls into the quagmire of the utterly irrational. No intelligent predication, so just reasoning, is possible except on the basis of the truth that is the absolute truth of Christianity. It is an insult to the living God to say that his revelation of himself so lacks in clarity that man himself through and through a revelation of God does justice by it when he says that God probably exists. I love that. It is an insult to the living God to say that his revelation of himself in man so lacks clarity that we can only say God probably exists. To say that the evidence merely shows that God probably exists is tantamount to saying that he does not at all exist. The God of Christianity is the God whose counsel or plan is the source of possibility. Let that sink in for a second. If God's the source of possibility, right, if you say that he possibly exists or probably exists, then there's a possibility he doesn't exist. Well, if he's the source of possibility, you can't have possibilities where he's not the creator of, of that thing, right? He's the one that can actualize possibilities. So he's back. What, uh, what is possible is determined by him and him alone. But, but we, we fall into this in our culture so easily. We tend to think of, well, I can imagine a world without God. No, you can't. If you actually thought about it, you can't. You're always being inconsistent. We could get into that. He says, the word possibility has no possible meaning except upon the presupposition of the existence of the self-contained ontological trinity as the source of it. Even when they conclude that a God exists and that with great probability, they are virtually saying that God does not exist. For the true God is not surrounded by, but is the source of possibility. He could not possibly not exist. Put that on your wall. He could not possibly not exist. We cannot intelligently think away God's existence. And Bonson picks this up and continues on with it. He says, and by pressing the unbelieving worldview to its consistent conclusions, we come to see that the transcendental necessity and thus the epistemic certainty, not merely the probability of the Christian worldview. Okay, so we're, we're in the business of epistemic certainty, not probability with Van Til. Anyone who knows Van Til's teaching and writings knows that he never tired of making known this high demand for the task of apologetics. Now he's going to quote Van Til. Van Til writes, we cannot allow that if rational argument is carried forth on true premises, it should come to any other conclusion. If you start with truth, whatever truth that is, you, you will never come to anything but the truth of Christianity if you're, being re if you're reasoning correctly. All truth is God's truth. Van Til aims for rational certainty, while his critics settle for less, namely, namely probability. So there's, there's a cl it's, uh, clear contrast between rational certainty and probability. The critics of Van Til are probabilists, evidentialists, and Van Tilians are not. And this is very clear from Van Til, as we read, and now also from Bonson. Because Clark has the illegitimate notion of possibility in his apologetical system, a notion which lies behind even his beliefs about God and God's word, it is inevitable that he should cease to be a genuine presuppositionalist. You cannot be a genuine Vantillian if you hold to an, an evidential, or as I'll say, probability apologetic. But Frame disagrees. Frame writes, this is in the beginning of his book. Van Til always said that there was an absolutely certain argument for Christianity, but he rarely produced an example except in the barest outline form. And that's actually true. I think Frame is right on this. And I don't think, I don't think Bonson, Bonson took it a little further, but not, not much further. It's, but we're gonna try to rem remedy that in this Sunday school. Okay, but then he goes on, he says, I am somewhat less inclined to make the claim of an absolutely certain argument for reasons that appear within. Now, when he says less inclined, he means he's not inclined, right? Because so he has Van Til's apologetic, and but he doesn't accept that it is one of absolute certainty, right? He has he he doubts that it is, and, and all he and every, anything that he writes about apologetics, he's always stopping short of that. Well, that tells me that effectively in practice, you don't actually think there is one, okay? Which so so what do we have left then? If there is no absolute certainty in our apologetic, what? But we should still give arguments. What do we have to have left then? What kind of Apologetic. There's no epistemic certainty. There's no certainty in our knowledge when we 
do apologetics. So what do we have left? What kind of apologetics? Probability, right? So it's either 100% or something less than that. Those are, the, those are your only two options. Okay, so this is a denial that Van Til's apologetic is one of certainty. And then it's an endorsement then, by logical necessity, of probability. Has to be. All right, so let's look at this. So Van Til and Bonson teach that Van Til's apologetic is one of epistemic certainty, and they also teach that probable arguments are inconsistent with Van Til's apologetic. Frame comes along and says that Van Til's apologetic is not one of epistemic certainty. And then says that probable, are, and then by implication, probable arguments are consistent with Van Til's apologetic. Well, you put these together, and it's a contradiction. You can't hold both of these things. You cannot hold both of these things. All right, well, so if the issue then is not whether we side with Frame against Bonson in interpreting Van Til. That's a common statement made by James Anderson at RTS and some other people who follow Frame, who are Framians, is, is that they're just siding with Frame against Bonson and how they interpret Van Til. But, you, but that's not the issue here. The issue is whether Van Til and Bonson are mistaken about Van Til's apologetic and Frame is accurate. That is the issue. Is Frame accurate and they're wrong? Now if they are wrong, then we gotta change it. We need to change this apologetic radically. But if they're not wrong, then Frame's not a Van Tilian. And we should just accept that and we should just move on. Okay, and it's okay. But he's not a Van Tilian then. All right, so in looking at this, I was, there, are, there are a number of tenets or basic rudiments or basic principles of Van Til's apologetic. The, th the three that come to mind, uh, which would be enough for this, are neutrality, right? We're against neutrality to Christianity. That'd be a basic commitment. God is the source of possibility. Cannot talk about possible anything without God being the creator of possibility, the standard of possibility. And God's revelation to man is epistemically clear, meaning that there is, there is no possibility that it doesn't get through to man, 100%. And that's in general revelation and special revelation. So these basic things that God makes known to us, he's the creator of the world, we are fallen right before him, we deserve his eternal wrath, these kinds of things are all known to man uh, immediately from creation and also through special revelation. Okay, now these principles, this is why this gets a little confusing, is Frame actually holds these. See, he's very explicit about over and over emphasizing that he holds these. And so you have this quasi Vantillian sounding evidentialist that, that comes out, which can make things very confusing for up and coming apologists who are learning it this way. So he says, when I oppose neutrality, what I oppose is appealing to something other than God's revelation as the ultimate standard of truth. Amen. And of course, Van Til is also right to suggest that when the subject of probability comes up, the Christian has the opportunity to show that the very idea of probability makes sense only on the basis of Christian theism. How does Frame know that? Is that just, is that probably true? He jumps back and forth, like he wants to be a Van Tilian, but then when the rubber meets the road and he actually does apologetics, it's not Van Tilian. And we should certainly not say anything to an inquirer to suggest that we can reason, predicate, assess probabilities, and so on apart from God. Amen. In principle, presuppositionalists have a higher view of evidence than some evidentialists do. In presuppositionalism, evidence, evidence is not a merely probable witness to the truth of Christianity, rather it is sure and certain. God's normative interpretation of it is the only rational interpretation of it. So you can imagine reading this book and thinking like, oh, I'm getting Van Tilian apologetics here. And you gotta be very careful on this because I think most people intuitively accept what Van, Van Til is teaching theologically. And you go back to the, through the history of the church and this is very just basic Calvinism that's been playing out for hundreds of years. And so we, we, we acknowledge that. If, if, I've, I've done this to actually uh, relatives of mine. I remember back in like 2010 explaining to my in-laws 
what Van Thielen apologetics was, because I was just converted to Van Thielen apologetics, and I wanted to explain it to them. And I explained it to them. They're like, well, that seems obvious. And it does. It does seem obvious that God is basic to our knowing, right? It's, it's intuitively obvious to Christians. But when you actually put it into practice of how do you actually do it, right, that's where the real difference should come in. Um, and, and it does when you do it in practice. So we should, be, we should be categorizing apologists by what they do in apologetics. The evidence for Christian theism, therefore, is absolutely certain. OK, so now let's look at doing apologetics and how these three assumptions would play out as we do the reasoning. So when we reason in apologetics, we talked about inferences. right? We're always going to somewhere. We have some goal that we want to get to. And we go to that goal based on premises. And if you dug down deeper into them, you get to assumptions. We all have to make assumptions when we start arguments. So we go from those assumptions, and we reason then to our conclusion. At every step of the way then, these assumptions, right, which are more meta assumptions, like they, they, they more look at the argument and influence what's going on, they, they play a role at every, every turn. So for example, neutrality. When I pick premises for my argument or assumptions, I'm not going to pick ones that are neutral to Christianity. Right? They're going to have to be explicitly consistent with Christianity. It wouldn't make much sense to pick premises that are inconsistent with Christianity. So you're going to make ones that are consistent. And how I reason is going to be how God wants me to reason. I'm going to make inferences the way he would want me to. And then obviously, if I started with premises that were consistent with God and his revelation, and I'm, and I'm reasoning the way he would have me reason, then I'm going to arrive at conclusions that are not neutral to him. All right, second, God is a source of possibility. If I'm going to take premises and evidences and grab them and use them, then they have to be ones right, that are not ones of probability in doing this reasoning. Because if they were ones of probability, I'm trying to get to Christianity is true. Well, if I get to Christianity is true through probability, then I have not uh, put God first in probability, right? I haven't made him the source of probability. So your evidence is your starting point cannot be one of probability. And how you reason then, right? Transitioning from the premises to the conclusion cannot be one of probability. This is why this argument cannot be one that's a scientific argument, more inductive, where the conclusion likely follows from the premises. We see this in medicine all the time. You say, uh, medicine A treats symptoms X, Y, and Z, in most cases that we've you know, seen in the past. Uh, per Agent Smith has symptoms X, Y, and Z. So we give him medicine A, and we conclude what? Likely it will treat right Smith's disease or whatever Smith has. Now, it doesn't guarantee that it will, right? There could be something that we don't understand that he's an anomaly, and so then we have to further evaluate what, what's going on. But it's one of probability. And a lot of our reasoning is like that. It's more inductive. OK, but that's not this argument then. And then the conclusion, of course, uh, can, has to be consistent with God being the source of possibility. And lastly, revelation being epistemically clear, we need to pick things that are immediately clear to man that is true. Stuff that, that you, cannot, you cannot reasonably um, dis disagree with. And that would be true of your starting point. It would be true of how you reason. And it's true of your conclusion. All right, so think about that. If, if though, I introduce probability in my conclusion, all of this goes away. If I conclude that it's probably true, Christianity is probably true, well, then I've just denied these, these uh, assumptions. Have to. Because if I apply the assumptions correctly and consistently all throughout the argument, then they still hold up at the end. Well, if I conclude that God possibly exists or probably exists or likely exists, I've undermined he's the source of possibility. So I have to do something at this point. I have to give up my principles which is why, that's why evidentialists don't hold these principles in apologetics. Or I can give up that kind of arguing, but I cannot have both. And if you introduce probability in the end, then you have to introduce it either in how you're inferring the conclusion or the premises or both. It tends to affect almost the entire argument. 
So God's revelation is not epistemically clear then, and God is not the source of possibility. Okay, so that is enough. If you just had that presentation and you're reading Frame's book and you got to that very first couple, few pages, and he, and he denied this, no matter what he says in the rest of the book, this cannot be true. You cannot hold this and hold these principles. All right, but not, I don't want to just stop there with Frame. I want to go through a few things because what he interacts with is very common with what's been going on since Bonson died. So what Frame is interacting with in this book is very common subsequent to, to Bonson. So I think it's edifying for us to go through them. And the first thing is the fallibility of man. We'll put on our thinking caps here for a second and, and look at what Frame says here. He says this is one of the main reasons why he doesn't accept Van Til's apologetic to be one of certainty. He says, but to be honest, we ought to admit that many of our arguments are only probable, if only because there is so much room for error in their formulation. Think about that. This is a very, actually a very Kantian way to view the world. So is it true that our lives are mostly uh, fraught with less than certainty? We tend to think of it that way, that everything is kind of in flux at some level, right? Is this true of our arguments? Well, it depends what he means by arguments. Does he mean mathematical arguments? Because we have tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, probably millions of mathematical arguments that have not been overturned, and they won't be. That they play with certainty all day. There are, there are proofs that go back thousands of years that have not changed. Many of them, hundreds, thousands of them. Now, we can cosmetically change them, make them a little easier to understand, maybe more specific, but the root of the argument is the same. It still works. So maybe he doesn't mean mathematics. Maybe he means theology. Is it true that many, let's just say most, of our arguments in theology are subject to error and therefore could be false? Right, what we conclude could be false. Is that true? This is really important. What's that? It would be. What do we do in church with heretics? You excommunicate them, right? Assuming they don't repent and they you know, don't give up these heretical beliefs. Well, we wouldn't do that if it was probability, right? There's, it's not like we say, oh yeah, it's, it's likely that Jesus is the son of God, but you know, he might, he might not be. The Bible's not clear like 100% on that. No, of course not. And the history of the church is wrestling with these things and getting to what we call the plain teachings of scripture. So whatever are the plain teachings are the non-negotiables. So in our, in our denomination, in the history of the church, we would accept that baptism, certain views of baptism, are within the bounds, right, of being an Orthodox Christian. Uh, affirming God's the creator or denying it, right, those are not within bounds. You have to affirm he's the creator. You have to affirm the historicity of the Bible. Like, you have to affirm these basic plain things. So we have hundreds of things we know in theology with certainty. Sure, could you like cosmetically improve it here and there because you made some error in this? Oh, well, sure, but fundamentally it's, it's not changed. Well, does he mean apologetics then is fraught with error, possible error? Maybe he means that. Maybe he, he means apologetical arguments. Well, this isn't really fair because in the history of the church, every argument other than Van Til has been a, evidential. It has been by definition probability, right? So, so that wouldn't be helpful either because the history of apologetics has been one of probability. That's why Van Til is so, so unique. So if he's gonna make this claim, you actually have to make good on why this applies to Van Til's argument, which is the context in what, in what he's writing. But he doesn't do that. He just assumes this is like a given we should all hold. But let's assume he was right. There is no epistemic certainty in Christian theistic proofs then Van Til's apologetic is dead. There's no point talking about this. These principles that he, he held, we'd have to deny in apologetics, or we'd have to give up apologetics, right? One, one, one of these, these two things. I find it odd, too, that you can affirm that the evidence is clear, 100%. Frame said that over and over again. But when we touch it, and we want to use it for God's glory, we immediately make it subject to error. It just seems very odd to me, like how, how you could believe both of those things. If that were true, then I wouldn't touch it. <laughs> just leave it, right? Leave it and let it, let, let it be. 
All right, so the next thing that Frame talks about, which is again, it can be, it's very sly, and it, it's, it's sound, our, I think in the church, even though that some of us are, are prone to schisms, Presbyterians are prone to infighting and, um, but I think in our hearts, we do want unity. I do think Christians, because if they are Christians, they should desire unity, because that's what God desires, and we're his children. And we, some of us are closer to sanctification and that than others. But in our hearts, I do think we want unity in the church. I think all Christians uh, do want that. So what Frame wants to do here is he wants to take traditional arguments, by that I mean evidential, probabilistic arguments, and he wants to show that they're really not that different than what Van Til was doing. So his heart is to want to bring both of these things together so we can all, you know, praise God together and argue together. Uh, the, the problem is they don't go together. They cannot go together. Someone is wrong. That's just how it is. Okay, they're opposing positions. But then he'll say things that are just simply not true. And he doesn't show how he can demonstrate this. He says, in that sense, a proper causal, this would be the cosmological argument, or histor historical argument, does not go beyond scripture. It simply shows the applicability of scriptural truth to some area of the world, and thus it displays the Bible in its full meaning. They do nothing of the sort. I've never read an evidential argument that just simply uh, is, is applying scriptural truth to some area of the world, displaying the Bible in its full meaning. All evidential arguments take the Bible and say, let's just put it off for a second, and let's reason based on how we experience the world from evidences to that this Bible is God's word. That is inherent to all evidential arguments. None of them are just displaying the Bible in its full meaning. See, but he states that they're doing that. Well, if you think they're actually doing that, then you need to argue for them doing that because that's not how they've been used in the history of the church. So how does that look? He doesn't tell us. This is, again, why this is confusing. He says, our job is to present the Bible as it is. Amen. And to do so, we must often refer to it in various contexts. I agree. How does the Bible apply to medicine? How is, how is knowing God exists the precondition of us racing around, you know, erasing in cars and solving problems in mathematics? And yes, I agree. None of them are evidential. None of them. There is no context in which the Bible applies in which you use it evidentially. These things do not go together. Okay, and so does that make sense? That, so I, the heart of it is to, is to bring it together, but these things will not go together. Okay, the last piece I want to get into, and this is just going to be a little taste. We're going to get into more of this later on, more toward the end of our, our Sunday schools. What's the issue of circularity? Who has heard of circularity in reasoning? Thumb? Great. Excellent. Well, if you haven't, here, here's what's going on. So when we reason, we're going to a destination. Are we currently at that destination? No. What if you were already there, Ben? What if you were already there? Would you have to go there? No, right? That's why it's circular because you're starting where you're trying to go. So you're not going anywhere, right? It's just going in a circle. So is there reasoning that's happening then in this kind of circular argument? Is reasoning actually taking place if you're already where you need to go? No, it's not taking place. These are not arguments. That's why they're, they're rejected. Now let's say though that I hide the conclusion what if I hide it with a bunch of other things that I assume to be true, other premises? Is it still a circular argument? Yes. Why? I made it harder to find. Still I'm point. still starting the same point. Now, let's say I make it really hard to find. It's really down deep in there. Does that change it? No. Psychologically, it does. I'm going to put an argument up here. I'm going to see if you guys can find how it's circular. You can, you can trick people in making arguments very complex, but if at the heart of it is your conclusion, you are not arguing. So if the conclusion is there, it's problematic. It does not work. Doesn't matter what you dress it up with. 
So I call that formula, formula, formally circular arguments. Uh, some people call them viciously circular. So you could say be begging the question be another one. And this is where it's in the argument. So if you take the argument and you're holding it, and you're looking at the, at the premises, what you start with, if you dig into there, you're going to find the conclusion. That's a formally circular argument. Frame calls them narrowly circular. He says, in the fifth place, I have, in Doctrine of the Knowledge of God and elsewhere, distinguished between narrowly circular and broadly circular arguments. So he's, he's saying that Van Til's argument is broadly circular. That's his term for it. Van Til would say spiral, spirally circular. And we'll, we'll get into what that means. Okay, and I do think it's meaningful, but I don't think Frame understands what this means. We'll get into why that is. But he gives an example of the former, of the vicious. He says, the Bible is the word of God because the Bible is the word of God. That's a viciously circular argument. And he agrees that that's not a good thing to use. He goes, I agree with any non-presuppositionalist that this narrowly circular argument is not an apologetic claim in a serious sense. Great. He says, in fact, it acts as a contrast to those arguments that I believe have real apologetic value. Wonderful. But now he says, okay, so what is this broader argument then? You would think in a book that's teaching apologetics in the Van Tilian way would give us a lot of meat on this. It doesn't. He says, so what is the broader argument? The broader argument says the Bible is the word of God because of various evidences, and then it specifies those evidences. So evidentialism, that fits every evidential argument that there is. Eventually, if you stack them together, right, whether, whether you want to use one of them or multiple together, they are using evidences from our existence that we experience and getting to Christianity is true. Well, that's what you just said. So clearly it can't just be that, right? It has to be something more specific. But he never goes into how more specific it should be. He just leaves it out there. And then, but he, and then he's constantly interacting with narrowly circular arguments. And it, it's, it's telling me that he doesn't really understand the distinction between these two things. He, he, he's, he's wrestling with this issue. Okay, so here's an argument that he gives. This is just for us, to, it's an illustration. So premise one, what scripture says is always true. Scripture says that God exists, therefore what? God exists. What do you think? Is that a good argument? Well, let's just assume that these, yes, okay, good. So I think we could show that scripture says that God exists is really not deniable rationally, right? Like if language has meaning, it has to say this. But in premise one, how would you prove that? God has to exist, right? So if you dug into premise one, you would find that God exists. So this is not a good argument. But on its face, though, you could trick a lot of people with this, I bet. This is how we should reason as Christians, and you could put up premises like this. And I could make this actually a lot harder to find, and it would look convincing psychologically, and you'd jump on board. But it's, it's fallacious. It's not good. And now notice what Frame said, and this is what's really confusing to me in how to put together what he, how he even understands this kind of, how he even understands logic. He says, in one sense then, the argument is one form of absolutely certain proof for the existence of God. So he's saying, in, in a sense, this is an absolutely certain proof for the existence of God. No, it's not. It's not an argument. You can't have a proof that's not a proof. See, but in his mind, he, he has this weird conception of what it means to have an absolutely certain proof. I think that's where everything kind of breaks down for him. And so he thinks that Van Til, he wouldn't say Van Til is in this form, but he doesn't know why he's not in this form. So he just kind of dances around with these, with these things. So if you drill down into premise one, you would see that the conclusion has been hiding there all along. This is not in any sense an argument that has certainty. It's not even an argument. So if I hide it, all that matters is the conclusion is there. And if the conclusion is there, we don't have to go anywhere. We can just sit with it. 
stay where you are, which is God exists. Apologetics is really dead at that point, if you're just going to reason in a circular fashion. Okay, so he says then, and he admits this, the argument in question is narrowly circular because the first premise is so clearly dependent on the conclusion. You just got done saying earlier that we shouldn't use narrowly circular arguments, and yet this is what you give us for the broadly circular arguments. But you said it's narrow, but you're supposed to be talking about the broad. What is the broad? He doesn't know. And then he says this, which I still just scratch my head when he writes things like this. He goes, of course, all valid deductive syllogisms, that just means deductive arguments, are circular in the sense that the conclusion is already implicit in the premises. I have no idea what that means. We were t I was with you a little bit. You had, you had narrowly circular arguments. They go around and around. We don't go anywhere. I get that. Broadly circular is supposed to be some other thing that you're going to give us meaning to, but you haven't yet. But now you talk about this like third view of circularity, where really all deductive arguments are circular. I, I have no idea what this means. We, we have lost, we've gone off the reservation of consistency at, at this point. Okay, and this isn't, I don't want to, not so much to poke fun at frame, but, but to also show you, I guess I'm kind of doing that, uh, but also to show you that this is hard. Like this is a really hard concept to get clear. And if you don't, then you get into all sorts of, of things, of inconsistency. It looks like you're unpacking a concept, but you're really just making it worse. All right, so that's gonna conclude our frame discussion. There are a lot of other things I could go through in this book, but a lot of it is I'd have to set up, um, I'd have to talk through certain things like form of arguments and that kind of stuff, and so I just didn't think it'd be helpful to do it now. We're gonna do it later. Uh, one of the things that's probably the most common that frame interacts with is, is Van Til's argument a third kind of argument? This is, a, this is actually very um, popular. So Don Collette wrote an article in Revelation to Reason that Oliphant uh, edited where he, uh, he talks about this. Some people in secular philosophy talk about uh, transcendental arguments being some ki other kind of argument. What does that mean? Okay, so we have inductive arguments, probability, right? We're, going, we're saying like with the medicine, it's likely to follow. Deductive arguments the conclusion always follows. So if I say, if Jesus is the son of God, if the Bible is true, then Jesus is the son of God. The Bible is true, therefore, Jesus is the son of God. If those premises are true, does the conclusion always follow? If those premises are true, is it possible for the conclusion to be false? No, it always follows. And all of deductive reasoning, all of mathematics, all of logic is that that kind of reasoning. Well, the question comes up then, is what is Van Til's apologetic? We know it's not inductive, because it's not one of probability, despite what Frame would say. It can't be inductive. Is it deductive? Many, like Michael Butler, who was with Bonson and who did some work in apologetics after Bonson died, then kind of faded from, from the scenes. Don Collette and others would say yes, and I actually used to believe this at one point, that it is a third kind of argument. But then when I got into logic and was studying the forms of argument and going through this, I think it's very clear it's not a third kind of argument. It is a deductive argument. So a lot of this book, he's interacting with a false idea of what it could be. That's not his fault, that's just kind of what has happened in the last two decades. Uh, but a lot of the book is unpacking that, which I didn't think was helpful for you now, but will be, will be later. All right, any questions about frame or where we are here? Because this, this is gonna end our negativity. Okay, this is probably the, the least enjoyable part for me of, of doing this. It's necessary, I think it's good to clear the decks, so to speak, and get us fresh and ready to go for, for Van Til. Um, so we are gonna start now positively going forward. All right, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the power of your word. We thank you that you did not leave man in darkness, that you, you planned, you determined how the world would come about and that you would send your son to redeem us, redeem our church, 
to bring us out of darkness and to be a light to Minneapolis, to Minnesota, and to the world. Help us to stick together as Christians, to come together in unity and repentance and forgiveness, and that we would help each other to build your kingdom. Amen.